Welcome to Tomo Talks. I'm Tomo Marjanovic. I am here with Eric Appleyard, and we're going to have a conversation and talk about bartending, whiskey, and what makes a professional. Stay tuned. I'm going to say immediately, we may even call the episode Eric Knows All. Oh, God. <laughs> Don't introduce swear, me like that. I mean, I swear every time I have a question for Eric, <laughs> he has some type of answer. He has some type of conversation and he, you know, knows at least a little bit about almost every topic that I can have a conversation about. And we are talking about health, hormones, sociology, history, anthropology, politics, you name it. Eric may know something about it. So please introduce yourself, your education, your background, what you do now, everything about that. Oh, boy. How much time do we have? <laughs> um, so so my name is Eric, and I currently am a bartender at the London House, a nice private club in Dr. Phillips, uh, of which Tomo is a member. At London House, if I'm not mistaken, you are butler trained? That's correct. So very, uh, very expensive process, but uh, I know London House had several in the beginning that were butler trained. You got butler trained. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? Because not many people even get to experience it, let alone have the ability to pay for it because it's a, I mean, it's a very expensive venture for any business to even undertake. Bo both the founders of London House and the, the British Butler Institute made the most amazing agreement and concession and compromise because typically... Um, if a person wanted to become a certified butler with the British Butler Institute, they would have to fly to England, pay $6,000, and go through, I think, a, a minimum six-week course. And uh, somehow, I didn't ask questions, but they got the head instructor from that institute to fly to us here in Orlando, train all of us at once, and I think we condensed it down into four weeks, something like that. Knowing Adrian... He, he pulled some strings on that one. I, I'm sure a few friends were involved, but uh, it's incredibly intense and not, not, from a, not from a physical perspective, not from an intellectual perspective necessarily, although we did have to learn quite a lot of information. The real intensity was you had to completely change where you, where you put your focus, where you put your attention. So, for example, um, we had to spend 45 minutes learning how to hand someone a pen. And you might think, yeah, 45 minutes, one, a pen. 45 minutes to hand somebody a pen. Right. <laughs> and your mind might think, well, that's, that's easy. How hard is it to hand someone a pen? And the reality is, as, as a butler, as someone in hospitality who is very service-minded and service-oriented, it's not just handing them the pen. It's knowing that they specifically are very busy. They're very, their attention is occupied. So I'm going to hand them the pen in a way that they can instantly grab it, start writing, and not have to worry about any form of awkwardness or unexpected occurrences. So if someone were at a restaurant and they get their check folder and it's time to sign the bills, a server might put the pen inside, hand them the whole folder because that seems easier, more expedient. They open the folder, the pen falls out. Now they got to pick up the pen, it's fallen on the ground, you know, all these different things. We had to learn to, and the, again, it's simple, but remembering it in stages, you click the pen, you hold it with three fingers at the top, you face the arm of the pen towards the person, you hand it to them while inclining forward with one hand behind your back, you say pen, so you have to hand them the folder with one hand and then the pen to the other hand, the opposite hand. That's if they're European. Yes, if, if they are... Um, culturally Asian hmm. in any way, you would actually hand them the folder and then hand them the pen with two hands. Like and a business card. They do the same exactly. thing. Exactly. Like like we business had to card. do 45 mm -hmm. minutes of the business card too. The goal is not to hand someone a pen. The goal is to, across the four weeks, put into every single action you could possibly do for someone else the very clear mentality and very clear communication that you care about their needs first entirely. What a crazy concept. I mean, right. I, I've never I've never heard of that kind of detail going into anything. And I figured butlering was, you know, obviously service oriented, but that kind of detail is something that I've never even thought of. But it makes sense. It makes sense because London House, when you go there, for anybody that hasn't been there, uh, private members club, you do need to be a member or be invited by a member to go in. 
Uh, it's in Dr. Phillips in Orlando uh, off of Sand Lake. So they do have, uh, what is it, Immersion. Mm-hmm. Immersion now, which is a dining experience, which is uh, going to potentially get a Michelin star or maybe two. We're going for two. I'm pretty confident about it. Fingers crossed on that. Here's a sustainability mm-hmm. and obviously the normal Michelin star for food. Exactly. Yeah. So Chef Riku, very cool guy. Uh, I will eventually get him on the podcast too. Awesome. Yeah. 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 He, he'd be fun. Oh, yeah. And, and quite wild himself. But that is open to the public. It is. So immersion open to the public and they are able to book out a dinner. I, I don't know the pricing or anything like that, but I believe it's already booked out several months ahead of time. We're getting there. Yeah, I, anyone who's interested, definitely find out sooner rather than later. And you guys can find the link for London House below. Uh, absolutely excellent people. If you're interested in membership, link will be below. You can talk to them. Come stop by. And if you happen to know me, I'll bring you in for lunch. Perfect. You'll meet Eric, and we'll get to sample some very nice beverages like we have here. Uh, Eric, you brought some Glenlivet collection. I did. Explain what we have here, and I think we're going to need to have a drink. These are very special to me for a couple of reasons. So the first one on your side is the Glenlivet 14. And uh, this was a release that was strictly in the U.S. And it's it's really neat how they came by this. Uh, they did certain releases in various cities. I happened to attend the one that was in Orlando. And so we had this great event. They had the uh, historian and archiver for Chivas Brothers. Uh, and then they had the master distiller for the Glenlivet. And while they were talking, one of the... Um, Many of these labels are sort of related and interconnected uh, uh, business-wise. And so William Grant and Sons was in honor of Captain William Grant. He, uh, because of his service record, the Glenlivet wanted to partner with uh, the Purple Heart Foundation. So they created this bottle, and that's actually the reasoning for the the purple color on the label. Uh, For, I think it was... I think it was for every bottle sold, they would donate a dollar to the Purple Heart Foundation. And it was a huge release. As far as I know, it was wildly successful. And the scotch is fantastic. That's a cognac cask. Yes. Okay. So one has a cognac cask. Um, This uh, 15-year does a a French oak cask. And um, what results from that is different flavor profiles. So cognac is derived from grapes. And so when you barrel it, typically you you will char the barrel, barrel to get more vanillins out of it. But various flavors from the grape distillate is going to work its way into the wood so that when you put the scotch in, yes, you've got the malted barley uh, flavors mixing around, but they're going to take on a lot of fruitier aspects from uh, from the wood. Same thing with uh, French oak, different flavor pro- profile because French oak is remarkably different from American white oak. It will carry uh, a much softer profile. You get more vanillins, you get more cuvee, you get um, a what I think is a rounder uh, flavor to it as opposed to if you if you're drinking a really high vanilla and bourbon and there's a big char in the barrel um, you'll get just a mouthful of vanilla which is perfectly fine it's delicious but uh, I like some of the softer touches that you get from from French oak mm-hmm. the last one is the Glenlivet Founders Reserve now this is neat because it doesn't have an age declaration on it and this is something I consider very important because not enough people know it so many folks, especially whiskey drinkers, will look at a bottle and they'll say, how old is it? The older it is, the better it must be. But that's not true. <laughs> I, there's nothing about that uh, that correlates or makes sense in any way. The, the, the fact is, you can have a blend of ages, and most of these are. The difference is, with these two bottles, the 14 and the 15, there could be 18-year-old scotch in there. There could be 25-year-old scotch in there. Mm-hmm. But they've blended it, and the youngest scotch in the bottle is 14 and 15 years old. So that's the age they have to put on there. Well, if you're blending ages for a flavor profile anyway, then what does the age actually matter? Because one of the things about barrel aging, and several scotch distilleries have found this out the hard way, if you leave something in a charred oak barrel for too long, you won't just get vanillins. You'll get tannins. You'll get a lot of, of different acrid, bitter flavors. And it's vile. It is awful. And so there are, it's it's very difficult to get past the, the 20 year, 24 year mark and still have something good. So those who do it, good on them. It's well done. 18 seems to be my limit. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually 18 is about where I cut it off. And it usually seems to be the highest, the highest cost uh, scotches that I see around. Just about. I've seen 24 and 25 years. I've seen a 30 year. Are they good though? Are they good? It's not just a matter of good. Is sure. Are they unique enough for it to be worth that 
age declaration. And that's where I think people overlook things like this Founders Reserve, which is unique, is delicious, and is wonderful. You just can't slap an age on it. And there's a lot of artistry that goes into this. And I, I mean, I could name several other brands that put a lot of work and effort into what they do as well. And I've I've now had the wonderful opportunity to talk in depth with several master dis- uh, distillers for scotch. Mm-hmm. Every single one of them will tell you it's it's not how long you age it. There's so many different factors that go into it. There's so many, uh, you know, there's there's one guy, his name is Dr. Bill Lumsden. He's actually on the um, the board for determining all the regulations of scotch in Scotland. When I was younger, yeah, I have liked whiskey for a while. Okay. When I was younger, I always thought scotch was the old man drink. I was always like, it's the old man. Uh, my family owned a bar. Yep. Growing up, my family owned a bar in Willowick, Ohio. They still own it. It's still open uh, nice. for uh, 50 years, probably. 40 I knew you were from good years. people. Yeah. So we're all bartenders uh, yeah. by trade. Uh, my family immigrated from the, from Yugoslavia to the United States, and we were bar owners. Awesome. Uh, still there. So every time I saw someone order scotch, mm-hmm. it was like the old grizzled man ordering usually a cheaper scotch, but yeah. still. Uh, but that was like the old man drink. So what separates scotch? Bourbon's huge right now. Bourbon, oh, yeah. Bourbon is a huge, especially in the United States. So for those that don't know as much about scotch, what can you tell them about it? What makes scotch different than a bourbon? I know we can go down a rabbit hole here, but give, them, give them the reader's diet. Uh, yeah, I'll give the summary. It's all whiskey. It all comes from the same source, and it, it comes from a, a Gaelic word, ishkaba, and it means water of life. It's all whiskey. Whiskey is any grain spirit that nowadays you can do what's called a white whiskey, but it's really just unaged. Uh, Most whiskeys are aged in some type of barrel. The difference is um, bourbon has to be made in the U.S. Has to be from the U.S. It has to be uh, at least 51% corn in its mash bill, which is the the makeup of the different grains that go in. And it has to be aged in a never before used charred uh, white oak barrel. As long as you fulfill those things, you can finish it in whatever kind of barrel you want. You can age it however long you want, but that's what it needs to be bourbon. Okay. For scotch, it has to be barley. And that's that's one of the things that often will separate it from, for example, Irish whiskey. So historically, the Irish were the first ones to make whiskey, and they taught it to the Scots, they taught it to the Welsh, they taught it to the English. Round about late 18, early 1900s, uh, a lot of regulations started coming into um, the country as far as how you could produce your whiskey. And some of them were, were very necessary because people were pulling some, some they were cutting a few corners. Sure. Um, in fact, that's actually why the Glen, the Glen Livet is called the Glen Livet because so many people were trying to imitate them. We just saw that uh, scenario the other day mm-hmm. with the uh, Glen Livet uh, water, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it was called Speyside Glen Livet. Speyside Glen Livet, so ripping off the name. And these guys... Uh, they actually come with um, sort of a, a st- I don't know what you call it, stamp of approval. Um, What's the sequence we're trying these in, and do you have a method for this? Uh, yes. Which so what are we going to do first? We're going to start with the 14. 14? Yeah, we'll start with the 14. We'll work our way towards the founders. The, so I find the founders creamier. The 14 has a bit more fruit to it. So you can continue explaining what uh, kind of makes scotch scotch for so those. So it starts off with barley. And the... Oh, we're taking taxis home. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> Don't, we're going to add water to it. It's fine. Oof. <laughs> we're adding water to it. It's fine. <laughs> officer, I added water that to it. That doesn't work. Yeah, that doesn't actually it's work. It's fine. It's fine, officer. I added water to it. Uh, but we are... The gonna, bartender told me. Eric. We're going to do that for flavor, not for uh, sobriety. <laughs> but um, basically... In addition to having to be barley, uh, it has to be aged for, I believe, a minimum of three years. Okay. And I'm I'm trying to remember what Dr. Bill talked about with that. But um, what they'll do is they'll malt the barley, uh, and then, depending on what type of scotch it is, uh, in the malting, they may smoke it as well. And once the barley has started to malt, um, they'll take all the the sugars from that. They'll introduce a yeast culture, and uh, that will create the initial alcohol from which they'll then distill it and every distillery has their own still shape and and method and whatnot once it's distilled uh then it will go through aging and they can age in all sorts of barrels as far as i know there are no rules as to what type of barrel they can use 
provided they, they meet the, the minimum amount of time. Okay. Whoop. So I'm going to add a little bit of water to both. And what is that doing to it? Okay. This is where a lot of people get confused. and Which is why I wanted you to explain yeah, it. <laughs> I'm glad, no, I'm glad you asked. Anytime you have whiskey in a bottle for a long time, there's a lot of different molecules in there that provide flavor. Some of them are short chain. Some of them are long chain. The long chains have a habit of curling up on themselves. What we want to do is we want to make them uncurl. Uh, the Scots actually call it unfurling the dragon. So what they'll do is they'll take a spoon of room temperature water and they'll add that to their scotch. And that will allow all of those long chain molecules to open up. So you'll get a lot of the brighter flavors, a lot of the fruitier flavors, and it'll help the personality of the scotch come out a bit more. Now, is scotch supposed to be chilled? Okay, so this is the other half of it. You can put ice in it. However, that's going, uh, you know, we all know I, uh, cold things have a tendency to make certain things shrink and the molecules are no different. It will unfurl the dragon. The molecules will actually curl back up. And so you'll get woodier flavors. Um, you'll get a lot of the darker flavors, uh, uh, especially if they're smoky. There is no right or wrong. It's not good or bad. It's what do you want to taste more of in your drink at that time? And the same thing goes for um, any type of whiskey, especially bourbons too. If you want to taste a lot of the fruit notes, let's say you're, you're having a Woodford or you're having um, uh, a Michter's, put, put just a splash of room temperature water and you'll get a little bit more of the personality and a little less of the proof because you know it's going to temper the ethanol a little bit. If you put something cold into it, like a block of ice, Nothing wrong with it, but you're going to get a lot of those deeper, darker flavors. Hmm. All right. So, let's have a let's have a taste. Cheers. Cheers. I'm tasting the apple a lot. That's what yep. I'm, that's what I'm tasting the most. Of. Big time. Yeah. In bartending, mm -hmm. you've been bartending for six years. What has that done for you from a professional standpoint? What has it done for you from a personal standpoint? I know that you have uh, something going on on the back burner. I don't uh -huh. know if we can say it out loud or if we can even hint at it. Parts of it. Yeah, we can. So we can hint at it. Uh, so what has that done for you personally? Because people automatically think like, you know, if you're a professional, so you go to college, you have degrees, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'm going to leave all that. I'm going to leave sociology and anthropology and all these different careers. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to bartending. People may look negatively on that. <sighs> some people can look negatively on that, you know? I More mean, than some. Yeah. So, you know, you can see that. I, I could even see friends and family looking negatively that you're leaving all of this education because you're a very educated guy. I absolutely agree. And it's, it's inter interesting because more and more videos are coming out now of bartenders explaining why they are still in the service industry doing what they do. You may not realize it, but the guy who's, you know, cleaning up your spill could be making six figures, working three or four days a week, has a business on the side and spends, you know, his time off doing whatever he wants, you know, going surfing, going on trips mm -hmm. and he's doing what he loves and he has good friends doing it. A lot of people, and I include myself in this, can be afraid, and I mean paralyzed with fear, at the notion of striking out on their own, at the notion of switching jobs, switching careers, switching, you know, saying I'm going to do something completely outside of my wheelhouse. There's this idea that if you, if you go into a new field, you're starting at zero, and that means that everything you've done up, up until that point is somehow a failure because it, did, it didn't amount to, to anything or enough. Hmm. I've been told, well, I've been asked many times by many people, why are you a bartender? Like what, why, and it, I'm sorry, I misphrased. Why are you just a bartender? I hate that statement. Yeah. I, I hate that <laughs> statement because I used to get it when I was a cop. Uh-huh. Yeah. Why are you just a cop? I'm like, what do you mean oh just God. a cop? I was, <laughs> I went to school for that. I, that's my, that's my mm -hmm. background. Yep. You know, like people know me as a uh, entrepreneur now, mm -hmm. but I hated that when I was a cop. I didn't, what, you're just a cop. Uh, I'm like, okay, you don't know what the job is. You have no idea what we're doing. Exactly. Or, or all the different things that go into it. I mean, you know, we just, we just dissected what might go into handing someone a pen. Mm -hmm. The line there is in culture of what constitutes professional and, and a business. Mm -hmm. and what constitutes, you know, oh, you're, you're just doing this for fun. It's just a hobby. And don't get me wrong. For me, it, it was always intended to be a hobby. It was always intended just, to just be for a short time. But 
it is creatively challenging. It is intellectually challenging. It is uh, wonderfully fulfilling in, in the people that you meet along the way. I, you know, I certainly have no complaints about it. And it opened me up to a world of creative expression and entrepreneurial opportunity that I never would have considered 10 years ago. Yeah. And with that entrepreneurial opportunity that you have, you're doing something right now, you're creating something mm -hmm. that is completely unique, that has not been done, that people have actually attempted to create, but mm -hmm. have failed. Yep. And you're... I don't, I don't want to put too much information out there. I'm going to let you explain. Sure. You're, you're, you're doing something in that field, in bartending, in mixology. And I'll let you explain why I can't call you a mixologist. You, you're, you can't call yourself a mixologist. Uh, I want to call you that because it sounds cool. I think it's a new trendy thing to say. <laughs> Bartender's not cool enough. Mixologist is the way to say it. Well, I appreciate that. And it's so mixologist is a word that's been around for a while and it was created by newspapers. Back in the late 1800s, um, reporters wanted a fancy way to say bartender without it sounding low class, yeah. you know, and it was really, it revolved around guys like uh, Jerry Thomas, who who added the, the prefix professor, Jerry Thomas. And the idea was he does so much more than just pour a beer. So we, we need a catchy term for it. And, and putting ologist on the end of anything was very in vogue. <laughs> well, since then, you know, bartender could be a lot of people. You could be pulling taps, you could be pouring shots. The trouble is there are plenty of people out there who really love the the ego boost of saying, I'm, I'm a mixologist. Mm. Is that like a certification? So is mixology a certification no. that you get? Okay. That's just it. There, there is no, there's only one way you could legitimately say, you know, what, what do you do? I'm a mixologist. If that is your professional title on your jacket. Hmm. So Bobby Gleason, it says, in his contract for Beams and Tory, he says master mixologist. That is master mixologist Bobby Gleason. Okay. Yeah. So he could say that and he's welcome to. The rest of us, you know, un until, until you get that title, it's a little egotistical to say I'm a mixologist. If someone else describes you that way, perfectly fine. There is a lot of science that goes into it if you want to go the craft route. So typically what we'll say is uh, I'm a... Um, cocktail bartender or a craft bartender. And, craft bartender. Yeah. I've heard that a lot. Yeah. And that's that's usually sort of the compromise to saying, no, I work in a bar, but I'm 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 not just pouring beers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. They make great money too. Absolutely. So this this uh this episode might go a little long because we still have a <laughs> couple uh scotches to sample. Um but yeah, I mean pour this one a little lighter so you don't yeah, have to okay. carry me home. I'm only gonna we're only gonna do one on this one. All right. So with your new venture, explain that because when you explain, and I'm going to just hint at it, bitters. Mm -hmm. I don't even think I really knew what bitters were until you really explained what bitters were and kind of how important they were in bartending. Yeah. So bitters are our spice rack, basically. It's our spice collection. Bitters are a an alcohol solution into which numerous spices and herbs have been infused, usually through maceration. And so they'll be left to soak and all of the flavors will integrate into the alcohol and then we'll dash it into the drink and you can create so much depth and complexity of flavor. And a lot of times people will say, well, why would I want something bitter in what I'm doing? Bitterness brings out complexity in other flavors. It, it complements through contrast. So the cool thing is you can make bitters taste like darn near anything. You can have, you know, chocolate bitters, orange bitters, apple bitters. You can have uh, aromatic bitters full of spices. You can have celery bitters. Think of a flavor. It, it exists. The hard part is when you start getting into ingredients that are a little controversial. And so there's one that the FDA does not like people messing with. And for good reason, it's dangerous. But, before, you know, I'm not necessarily going to say what it is just yet. When people ask me, what do you like to drink? I always say, well, it depends on the weather. Oh. And yeah, That's exactly. Good. Oh, Th so this is the one drink, the one scotch where it doesn't depend on the weather. If it's at any old day and I want a scotch, I want a good scotch that I can appreciate. Keep your 12 year, keep your 18, keep your 25. Mm -hmm. Give me the 15. Wow. Any well day of the year. 15. Yep. And strangely enough, when I was at that release for the 14, I got to talking with um, uh, with the archiver and historian for, for Chivas Brothers. Mm -hmm. And we were talking. He said, well, what's your favorite scotch? And I mentioned a few others. I said, you know, it depending on these conditions. I said, but you know, my anytime go-to, my 
no matter what day of the year it is, is the Glenlivet 15. He goes, oh my God, that's mine too. Yeah, there's just something about, it's so impressive. I have never met anyone who tries it and doesn't go, oh, oh wow. It's really smooth. Mm -hmm. Really, really smooth. I've always been like a McAllen fan, mm -hmm. but you know what? I'm a uh, <laughs> little 15. That might've just taken the cake. Absolutely. Wow. M McAllen's very good. And this is one of those times where it has nothing to do with best. It has nothing to do with, with one being better than another. McAllen is for many people, but not everyone. Glenlivet's for many people, but not everyone. And you could say the same thing about, you know, uh, Isla Scotches, which are really smoky uh, and peaty. You could say the same thing about um, something like Glenmorgie or Oban. McAllen, from what I remember, they have a shorter neck on their still. Mm -hmm. And the result of that, there's this thing called reflux where the, uh, the longer chains um, can't get up the the still neck to go through the swan's neck into the condenser so they'll fall back down the heavier the molecule the harder it is for to, to get through to the condenser and so one of the things with the callan is their their necks are shorter so you get less reflux and that means that more of those long chain molecules that actually provide more viscosity and a more unctuous uh mouthfeel hmm. to the whole thing get through which is why uh, mccallan is a fuller bodied scotch and something like the 14 or 15, something like a Glen Morangy, those are much lighter, much fruitier. Well, uh, through this last bottle, which I'm the most excited because it's not aged. It doesn't say an age. I'm sure it has several ages in it. That's right. Uh, everybody is probably tuning into this and they're going to have several episodes that are talking about hormones, talking about health, talking about fitness. You happen to know quite a bit about hormones. You even have a little bit of your own hormone story Yep. Uh, from a personal standpoint. So, you know, when I, when I say Eric knows all, I can literally have any, any conversation with him and I'm able to have a good conversation with my bartender, who I like to call mixologist, <laughs> and uh, you have a little bit to say about it. So tell me a little bit about your hormone knowledge, your hormone journey, and uh, we'll wrap it up with that. And then I'm, we're going to have to just bring you back to uh, more episodes so we can have more scotches. That'd be great. I'm... I'm there's, there's two other Scotch brands I really want to introduce you to. Fantastic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, then we can move on to bourbon. So, boy, my journey studying hormones. Um, you have a personal experience with hormones, yeah. from what I understand. Yeah. So, one of the things that's happened along the way um, in my life is a whole lot of calamity. <laughs> Just disasters, accidents, and whatnot. And so, my father was pre-med in school and wound up becoming a marine biologist. And as we were growing up, especially when times were tough, um, his, he, he constantly kept up on medical knowledge and research. He was always, I mean, both my parents were fascinated by the world. They were both trained scientists uh, by education who wound up also being trained artists as well uh, by profession. And when we would get sick, there was a question of, all right, do we, you know, do you need a doctor? or do you just you know, need a little bit of intelligent care? And so when I got older, uh, especially if injuries had happened, I needed to know, you know, do I really need a doctor? And especially if the doctor didn't entirely know what was going on, and that happens, um, should I dig deeper? And should I trust that there's a much older tradition um, in terms of, of medical knowledge than just seeing a specialist? And I, and I say this, as part of the the uh, as part of Western medicine, endocrinology um, became a fascination for me. Probably around age I'd say twenty four, um, because my brother and I were living together and we noticed something. He was going bald, and I was having trouble growing a beard. Hmm. Strange, right? And not not to me, but not tell to people, you. Not, yeah. but tell people why. So his big question was, why am I only going bald here? <laughs> not here, not here, mm -hmm. you know, nowhere else, but right here. And so, you know, the, uh, the understanding about conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone had just been coming, you know, I mean, Rogaine had been around for probably about 10 years, but it was not well understood by the public. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, um, you know, I was... Uh, 
for you know, I haven't I haven't stood up, but I'm I'm about six feet tall, maybe 165 pounds, and I was training in stunts. I was doing gymnastics. I was training as an acrobat. I was you know lifting kettlebells. I was, I was doing a lot, and I eat like a horse. And I was still this skinny, and I'm about 165 pounds right now. So my big you know for a long time people go oh how lucky are you Eh, (laughs) not if you don't know what's causing it and so there came a point where i i was wondering all right what what's driving this because i've never seen among any of my friends this type of difficulty in putting on muscle weight and put in in gaining strength and doing it without incurring an injury and that that just started me down the path i mean i based on my education and my fascination with uh, kinesiology and and sport science uh, and nutrition, I went down a rabbit hole um, that really encompassed every aspect of of human performance. Uh, Endocrinology became sort of like that that missing link uh, because there's so many things that depend on it. There's so many things that, that turn on how your hormones are optimized and prioritized Mm -hmm. and that's the thing people miss it you know health is about optimization and prioritization and so uh as i got older and then when i met my wife uh when we got married you you don't realize how incredibly miraculous your body is all of the functions that it goes through the the chemical and neural functions that that happen without you ever knowing that it's going on and you don't appreciate it until it stops and once it stops, you instantly say, why? Mm. And what can I do to fix it? And so uh, my wife and I have been just, I've probably for the past, I mean, we started dating about 10 years ago. So yeah, for the past 10 years, we've just been going deeper and deeper into how does the body work and how can we make it better um, to, to fix the things that, you know, unfortunately we're all, we're all born with some kind of handicap, whatever that might be. Um, how can you shore up your weaknesses and then you know, ensure that your strengths never leave you. And so that's, that's been my, uh, my dive into, into hormones. It's, it's a big world, but it makes, it makes all the difference. Oh, I mean, optimal hormones. I, I say it constantly having optimal hormones is the only way to properly have an optimal life. If your hormones are off, mm-hmm. there's nothing we can do for you. It's it, that's, 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 you're going to be, uh, on a hamster wheel. Mm-hmm. You can diet all you want. You can exercise all you want, like you did. You can do all of these things if your hormones aren't correct. Nothing we can really do for you. Yeah. I, thank you for coming on. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I mean, you fed me scotch. I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to have you on every week. I sort of bribed my way on to this. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have three uh, very good bottles of Glenlivet. Absolutely, mm-hmm. you can come on. So if anybody wants to be on the podcast, <laughs> you can bribe me with liquor. It's the perfect way. Cigars work as well. Just so we're clear. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate your insight. And again, I, I swear, I, I, I can't wait to have more conversations with you for everybody else because I really want people to understand that, you know, every single person, bartender, college professor, every single person has unique, just unique benefits to the world. And, you know, I hate people saying, you're just a bartender. You're just a cop. You're just this. You're just that. You're not just that. You're not just that. You're more, and you probably have a lot of education experience from before, and that's going to propel you into whatever you're doing. That's the most amazing thing about it. I was a cop three and a half years ago. I now own a multi-million dollar corporation in the medical industry. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> there are amazing things that can happen. You have to believe in yourself. You have to. You have to understand that you can really do anything, and you're not just that. You're much more. So, you know, have some faith in yourself and really get yourself to uh, the next level. Thank you again, Eric. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate having me.